Today's program will move through a big picture and then down to some very specific things. And at the end of the day, we'll talk some about some of the efforts underway to make sure that we continue to stay connected and the ways to help encourage um, our government, particularly at the national level, to engage even more with UNESCO and to re-engage and to directly become part of the broader conversations. A person who will help us think about that in the next phase is the Global General Secretary of Education International, which is truly one of the uh, most important and central of global organizations that have brought together around the planet educators, uh, 32 million in fact, in the organizations in um, over 170 countries from around the, around the world. Uh, David came to that position about a decade ago or to that organization. He's uh, only recently become in this position, but in the, his career, he among other things was a public school, high school teacher, also was one of the education specialists at the Organization of American States and, and served as an associate director for uh, the National Education Association here in the United States. That focus, that moving from the local in the school to the hemisphere in the nation and now stepping forward to be the leader for the global association of the educators is an example of the kind of leadership that individuals can and many do bring to this notion of using education and how we learn from each other as part of the process of building peace, of building this planet into a more peaceful, a safer, sustainable, more resilient place. I mentioned earlier, Governor Stassen, who was tapped by Roosevelt to be one of the founders of the United Nations. Over the years, he was very, very close to and fond of UNESCO because he went on to be a, a president of uh, the University of Pennsylvania. And UNESCO would tap him on occasion to do special projects and he would take a leave from his work to help, for example, to create a new university in Turkey and other really when politically sensitive and politically important large scale things. Um, Minnesotans have always been there to be part of that global process, whether it's UNESCO or the World Food Program or the World Health Organization. And so we're very, very proud and pleased to be able to be part of this larger conversation that's taking place here today. We will be moving into a big picture. Uh, David Edwards has been tracking exactly what has been happening to students, to learners everywhere, to educators, to teachers everywhere. And some of that was reflected in the uh, kickoff ceremony uh, that uh, Director General Azoulay led this from the UNESCO headquarters there in Paris this morning. Um, again, I wanna urge any of you who uh, would like to see a really uh, kind of co complete picture from what UNESCO's activities are, uh, that would be worth going to their website at some point. Uh, they will archive it uh, in this coming week, I believe. So it's the kind of thing where we can work together. Uh, we're in Minnesota, but we're all virtual and global. UNESCO is in Paris, but they're virtual and global. And all of you joining today have come to see how we can use these tools to put ourselves into new kinds of relationships to actually help each other to get through this particular crisis. And this is something especially teachers have been helping each other and helping families and families have been helping each other. Uh, but also we can be clear about the necessity to build back better. And that makes me very, very pleased that Dr. David Edwards could join us today uh, from his offices in Brussels. Welcome. Thank you very much. It's so nice to be with you. I wanna thank you um, in your capacity as president, Mark, and also Global Minnesota, and thank Governor Waltz for his words. And I also just wanted to say hi to my friend, Mary Catherine Richter, who I know is now your education commissioner, but uh, I knew her previously as an AFT leader and member of Education International. It's just a real pleasure to join you all today. And um, I thought that was some very helpful, but sobering information from my friend, Director General Azoulé, and I want to thanks to her and her many other colleagues around the world. The perspectives and priorities of educators and students are not just simply an additional viewpoint. 
the input of teachers is instead becoming embedded into global discussions on the way forward. And advocates in the education sector are working together now in common purpose to an unprecedented degree. And I'd like to say that UNESCO under Audrey's leadership deserves much of the credit. In that spirit, I wanted to speak with you all today about the teaching profession globally, as Mark said, in the context of this past year, what we have experienced, what we've learned, and a little bit about where we are going, and most importantly, where we need to be going. I'd like to start by telling you a little bit about EI. Mark mentioned it already, but Education International is the Global Federation of Education Unions, representing more than 32 million teachers and education support personnel from early childhood education to university and 385 affiliated member organizations in 178 countries. Our headquarters is in Brussels where I am speaking to you from right now. And we have regional offices in Africa, Asia, Europe, Latin America, North America, and the Caribbean. Our mission is to promote the universal right to quality public education, advocate for the professional status, rights, and working conditions of educators to be a leader in the fight for social justice and equity. And then came COVID. In the span of months, 1.5 billion students out of school. That's billion with a B. And I think it's really hard to wrap our heads around such a number. It's as if a global hurricane swept through and each of us was cast into boats to do the best we could. Of course, existing inequalities were laid bare and exacerbated by the crisis. So the, the people of the world, same storm, but very different boats. Imagine no access to the internet. That's nearly half the world's population. Picture no electricity, that's close to a billion people. For every student a teacher could actually engage, many more were left out because of lack of resources, missing learning time they can never make up. And in many parts of the world, falling back into child labor or the low priority status too often afforded to girls. Wherever they could, educators stayed on the job, reinventing their professional practice by the hour, teaching lessons over internet video apps in Belgium, recording radio broadcasts in the Republic of Congo, driving school buses with mobile Wi-Fi to provide hotspots in remote locations of the US. Social media platforms lit up with teachers sharing tips, ideas, technologies, and learning management strategies from their kitchens, from their cars, or socially distanced classroom, scaling emergency learning with no planning or lead time. Everyone who could sorted through the chatter to find what worked best right now. What do we know? What matters? What can wait? What lesson do I eliminate? Who didn't get breakfast? How do we protect our kids? How do we find the kid who seemed to simply disappear? As the story of this crisis unfolded, it revealed some universal basic truths in education. First, teachers and students need to be safely together in schools. Ask any parent, ask any teacher. Among the first actions we took in the pandemic was to survey our members to establish guidelines for safely reopening schools. The guidelines led with a call for transparent communications from governments with decisions closely tied to the advice of health experts, continuous dialogue with educators and their unions, and the recognition with resources that already vulnerable students and education workers may continue to be the most affected. Teachers, and education support personnel all over the world, they mobilized for their students and their unions, and they emerged as primary structures of support, providing practical information, advice, and spaces to share experiences and work together. In many countries, unions have also been instrumental in guiding government response to the crisis. We at EI, we've worked directly in an official advisory capacity with the World Health Organization to keep educators informed and to keep the safe reopening of schools high on the global agenda. UNESCO and EI have been urging globally that educators and education support personnel 
be included as a priority group for vaccinations. And I am so pleased to see that this is already the policy in Minnesota, but still not in nearly enough places. Time and again, we heard the same thing, that schools are irreplaceable. They are the heart of our communities, centers of learning and health, central to our economies and our sense of nationhood and identity. Parents and communities reinforce the notion of schools as a foundation for emotional development, socialization, and nutritional well being of children. At the same time, the crisis gave us fresh perspective on research often cited by the OECD's Andreas Schleicher, specifically research that showed that the skills that are easiest to teach and test are also the skills that are easiest to digitize, automate, and outsource. The dead-end future families fear and nations scramble to avoid. Specifically, the idea that teachers could be replaced by some form of transactional technology was exposed. But nowhere has the pandemic taught us to re-examine the role of teachers and schools more than in this area of technology and the tools of teaching and learning. Do you remember when the pandemic hit and all those carefully prepared and highly collaborative distance learning systems swung into action? Remember that? No, I don't either because it didn't happen. Well, for the most part, online and distance teaching and learning was never a plan or a collaboration between school systems and educators and families. Instead, in many parts of the world, it was and is mostly a Wall Street wager for entrepreneurs and hedge funds in an evidence-free marketplace of promises. Teachers in far too many places are guinea pigs as education technology experiments cycled through schools. Governments and school leaders routinely failed even basic due diligence on the front end or had accountability on the back for using public money to buy what we now know to be snake oil. We used to be told that ed tech would introduce a much needed disruption of the education system. Instead, the pandemic was the disruption and it led to a bonanza for ed tech, its biggest year ever in 2020. Startups in the US alone raised a reported 2.2 billion in venture and private equity capital. That's a 30% increase from the 2019 total. So get ready. The salespeople are coming. Fact is, we do need better technology, better experiences. EI has had protocols in place to help guide the use of technology in education for many years. Digital technology should be an essential part of an educator's professional practice, integrated into the schools as a tool to enhance teaching and learning, accompanied by professional development and the collaborative work needed to make that tool effective. Looking ahead, the lack of effective tools and resources and the absence of training and collaborative time to use what's already in hand is a symptom of an overall crisis that now seems certain to outlive the pandemic. The world's education systems are in deep trouble. Today, International Education Day, our colleagues at the Global Campaign for Education have launched the One Billion Voices campaign to raise a worldwide alarm about what they call the seismic threat to education progress already underway. The World Bank has already projected a potential 10% cut in education budgets due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Our colleagues at GC said, the world faces a tipping point as vulnerable communities, including children with disabilities are excluded from education. Overall, they say it is increasingly urgent for governments to involve civil society organizations in the drawing up of education budgets. That's us. And it seems very straightforward, doesn't it? I mean, public demands for allocating resources and holding politicians accountable make a difference. Families and communities can join with teachers and others to insist that decisions about national priorities and resources be made in a democratic fashion. 
In some places, it's called social dialogue. In other settings, it's called negotiation. Where I come from in Western Pennsylvania, it might be called being at the table instead of on the menu. But straightforward does not always mean easy or simple, especially when powerful political forces work to delegitimize government and the public sector, and especially the very idea of truth. We know that among the countries most deeply, deeply affected by the pandemic, denial has trumped dialogue. Many of these hard hit nations, including the US, have been led by anti-science authoritarians who've encouraged their followers to embrace nonsensical medical treatments, failed to properly resource the public sector in health or education, and then pitted their political movements against both medical facts and the media that report them. By contrast, countries that have experienced less severe outbreaks of the pandemic and are transitioning more smoothly back to school and work, focus sharply on science, have robust public sectors, and media and unions. The tools to make government work in a democracy are straightforward, and they're built around the lessons most of us learned in school. Public policies must be grounded in fact. Fictions are fictions. They're not just the other side of truths. The public sector, like the Republic itself, to paraphrase Franklin, belongs to us all, if we can keep it. Health, education, public safety are public goods constantly under threat that can never be taken for granted. Last week, President Biden recalled the painful lesson taught to us by lies told for power and for profit. He said, each of us has a duty and responsibility as citizens, as Americans, and especially as leaders. Leaders who have pledged to honor our constitution and protect our nation to defend the truth and to defeat the lies. After the last four years, these words have an especially profound meaning in our country. But they resonate around the world, especially at a time when the US begins to re-enter the global community. This re-entry comes at a time of profound and deepening crisis for children and education worldwide. The UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres called it a defining moment for the world's children and young people. Less than a decade ago, the UN unanimously declared that free, high-quality, equitable education is a critical global goal for sustainable development, essential to democracy, and a linchpin to solving the climate crisis and hunger, just for starters. Educated societies with vital public sectors are healthier. Family incomes are higher. National poverty is reduced. So is child labor and violence against girls and women. EI was so proud to help lead the fight for these goals, mobilizing educators in a two-year campaign in every continent, in every corner of the globe. And all of us know that quality education is not inevitable like democracy, too often we realize its true value only in its absence. When we are forced to pay the price for a crisis born of ignorance and neglect, of dismal and, let's face it, deceitful leadership. As educators and unionists, we have the responsibility to teach and defend the truth. Going forward, we have an added duty, an absolute responsibility to identify, call out, and correct misinformation, disinformation, and outright lies. I will say fully acknowledging my partisanship and revealing the content of my absentee ballot that the U.S. election has already had a profoundly positive effect on the course of the pandemic in the U.S. and the effect will only grow and have a global impact. Let this same transition be the start of an equally profound effect on the lives of all of our children everywhere, because the whole world is watching. Thank you very much. David, thank you so much for those inspiring words, but also for that big picture about how impactful this COVID has been 
about all those different ways that educators and teachers and families and people have responded and about the challenges in front of us, especially when some would cut further or some would not directly ad address some of these issues. And so I wanted to ask you just a little bit more here, very specifically this campaign, The Billion Voices. Can you tell all of the folks watching from around the planet how we could get involved? What's the, um, what's the way to find out just a little more about that? Sure. So, so Global Campaign for Education is, um, it actually goes back to, without getting into the sort of education history, it, go, it goes back to Dakar. Before where there were sustainable development goals, um, we had education for all. And at that time, the world leaders were not listening to civil society. And so all of the social movements, the NGOs, the teachers unions, it was actually partly led by the Nobel laureate Kailash Satyarthi. Um, we got together and we formed the Global Campaign for Education. And there is a Global Campaign for Education, I believe in almost every single country in the world. The one in the US, I think for many of the folks in, in Minnesota would be most familiar with, um, but that's Global Campaign for Education US, and you can actually sign up to get part of the Billion Voices campaign. And I would encourage you to do that because in the US, part of the campaign is ensuring that the US pays its fair share in coming back into the world uh, community, as well as making sure that education and educational opportunities in the United States um, are available to everyone. So thanks for asking. Yeah, and David, you know, we're, uh, we're in Minnesota devoted to the sustainable development goals uh, all along. See the pin. And um, so, for example, on World Food Day, of course, we were looking at the goal of zero hunger. And um, on World Health Day, you know, uh, good health and well being for all. In fact, we want to bring a World Expo to Minnesota on sustainable development goal number three on good health. But when you um, saw that need to get civil society more involved, it seemed like you were able to find a very wide range of partners, a very wide range of civil society voices and companies and, and, and others. Is this um, now uh, a way that we could see that term build back better? Could build back better be in fact build back and reach those 17 sustainable development goals by 2030? Well, I, th I think it's a great question, Mark. I, I, I think I'm a big believer in social accountability. Um, and, and I think the way in which you get social accountability to be embedded into making sure that, the, that we deliver on the SDGs is first and foremost to make sure from a rights-based approach that all families, all parents, all students, all communities understand what those goals are, what the indicators of their success are, and the ways in which to get involved in sort of making sure that governments, you know, live up to the commitments that they've made to, to realize like every year at the high level political forum, governments come and they give updates on their, you know, on their progress. And I think that, you know, the constituency of civil society is one of the most powerful um, that we can have. I do think we have to be careful because um, it's not a gift that governments give or that that anyone sort of gives to us. It's a responsibility we have and we have to be able to claim it forcefully and we have to be able to once we get the space also show up. One of the things that I, I often think is that um, no is not a policy proposal. It's good to be able to say no, but it's really important for civil society to come together and, and generate really good proposals for financing, for funding, for follow through, for monitoring, evaluation, and, and so on. So I think there's a huge role. I think it's an important part of, of the SDGs. And I think it's something that we have to continue to work at because civil society sometimes runs the risk of being an afterthought. We, let's, let's invite someone from civil society to this panel to that thing. And we need to really say, no, no, the main social accountability mechanism is civil society. Well, I really appreciate that perspective because I know, you know, some of the things we work on here, for example, the Sustainable Development Goal 3 about health, uh, 3.6 is reduce road fatalities and injuries by half by 2030. Well, it takes everybody to address distracted driving, drunk driving, 
uh, road safety engineering, public education enforcement. And I know for us, uh, like some of our largest players, like for example, the company Cargill, who internally made the decision to ban the use of cell phones by anybody during the day or at night on their phone and took the lead on lobbying the state legislature to get cell phone distracted driving banning. So your message about how we all are responsible resonates, I think, with that general notion that we're now uh, deeply moving towards uh, governance by goals, so to speak. We have climate goals that we must reach. We have goals on uh, deadly driving. We have goals on zero hunger. I know that uh, your organization and teachers in general have been looking down the road. What are the issues that have become, you know, ones that we've heard about? Uh, Director General this morning spoke about the technology questions and others. I believe that there's some initiative underway to try to strengthen and update the Convention on the Rights of the Child. Uh, we're in a new era. The first convention was coming out of the First World War. Uh, children were abandoned, children were wounded, children were dismembered, children you know, were in fact a critical part of what we understood about why we could no longer go on with these wars and these world wars. Can you give us any insights into where that kind of movement from what's an afterthought to what's crucial to what's a right might go into the future? Yeah, no, I think that's a, it's a really great question. And I think um, a lot of us and a lot of agencies are rethinking the assumptions that informed the decision making at the time in which some things were, were, were drafted. Um, the CRC, the ratification of it um, committee, in our own uh, country. Convention on the Rights, on of, the the rights of the Child. Excuse yeah. me, the Convention on the Rights of the Child. I get caught in acronym soup. I don't know if you do as well, but uh, <laughs> Absolutely. It's, one of my, it's one of my big problems. I try. But, um, you know, it's, it's partly because of the ratification process in the United States. When I was at NEA, I was, we worked on the CRC campaign. Um, but if you look at the sort of the movements now, if you look at it sort of Malala, if you, know, if you look um, at the, the climate movement, um, if you look at what students themselves are doing, they're no longer the subjects, or excuse me, they're no longer the sort of the objects of what you, they're the subjects of their own destiny, their rights holders who are not gonna wait for others to sort of solve their problems. They have views. And um, one of the things I'm really excited about, whether that's in terms of climate literacy or climate action, is I'm seeing student activism paired up with teacher activism and, and citizen action, demands for civic space, demands for civic education, for science to be taught, um, where you also have it going worldwide, where you have, you have the, the Global Students Forum, which is now forming. You have all sorts of student organizations that are, you have the Youth Forum at the COP, at the, at the Climate uh, Summit. You have it at the UN. Um, and there is actual accountability mechanisms being developed by, by young people, um, by the rights holders, who are going to inherit this planet, who are already not even waiting for inherit it. They, they're here now. It's not something that's going to come to them later. They're already claiming this is their planet, this is their future, and they're not going to stand by idly while someone tries to talk to them about clean coal curriculum or something like that. They want to actually know what the science is on renewables and, and things like that. So I find that to be really exciting. I think one of the challenges what we're going to have is, is that um, how some of these organizations are funded and supported so that they can, they, they're sustainable and can continue. They have a governance structure so that they can't be gamed and picked. Um, and that uh, it's, it's part of the, the larger sort of social accountability mechanisms that I talked about earlier. Um, um, I know in the United States, um, we've been really, really impacted by how young people have been the leadership on gun violence because when terrorists wanted to terrorize society, they went and shot our children and the children have said, stop. No, we must change. It's also been the case in the racial justice movement and the climate movement. So in this last election, the youth vote was the record breaking and not just the vote, but the 
you know, every aspect of old fashioned organizing was driven and dynamically so by young leaders. So it seems like one part of this future of building back better includes that uh, input and that leadership and direction from the young people who are in fact leading on the social movements. I know one of the uh, big issues that will um, roll forward is the re-engagement by the United States at the global level. Uh, um, Minnesota wants to host a World Expo and uh, we were not able to uh, put forth a bid because a couple decades ago, Congress decided that, well, we don't need to do that. And they had just dropped out and stopped paying dues of the international body. It took a lot of work to get consensus in the legislature with two presidents, but we were able to get them moving. And once they re-engaged and got the back dues paid of the Bureau of International Exposition, then suddenly the embrace of our ideas, our bid, our concept, and just of us as Americans rejoining um, the international you know, body, especially because we were so crucial at the creation, um, you know, just gave a lot of energy. And I'm, I'm, I'm anxious to see how that will re-energize us when we do move towards the, the total re-engagement in UNESCO. And I know that the National uh, Education Association in the United States, among others, is really taking a, one of the leadership roles. And I believe that in one of our green rooms here, um, Lily Garcia, the media past president of the National Education Association, who's written a powerful, powerful call on the US to rejoin. I wonder if uh, Lily can, oh, there you are, Lily. Greetings and, and welcome from El Paso. We won't talk weather yet. We'll get to that later. But Lily, your leadership in both the Education International, but here, um, in the United States, in the NEA is really important, but now you're stepping out and helping to guide and direct that public voice about the importance and necessity, the crucial uh, work needed to rejoin UNESCO and to do it soon. Can you give us some background and, and, and uh, recruit all of the folks watching here onto this campaign? Uh, thank you, Mark, and thank you for inviting me to just uh, share a little bit about what I think is a very, very important piece of work uh, that the United States has to do. Uh, and, uh, and you can see why we're so proud of uh, David Edwards now, uh, who started out with NEA when I think, what were you, 14 years old, David? <laughs> uh, and you still look 14. Uh, but I also want to give a big shout out to my Education Minnesota uh, family here and Denise Beck, uh, their president. Uh, happy, happy, happy International Day of Education uh, to everyone who's celebrating in this virtual uh, event. And thanks to everyone, not just the organizations, but all of the individuals who are on this uh, event call right now, because you're invested in the future of students across the world. And I am so excited. You can see why David is so excited. We're all excited. Um, to include now in people who love public education and love our students, our new Biden administration. Um, we're not always gonna agree with everything that they do, but we've got an open door and they do appreciate, appreciate um, what we have to say as educators and as advocates. So I'm, I'm, uh, I, I have hope today, like I haven't had in oh so many years. And I wanna congratulate Congratulate President Biden. Can I just say those beautiful words one more time? President Biden. So thank you, President Biden, for taking very swift action to bring the United States back into the world community after four years of unnecessary isolation because our voice and our influence have been absent in so many places in so many ways. And my heart sings that some of the first actions of this new administration were to lift up the importance of American participation in things like the Paris Agreement on Climate Change, the World Health Organization, the Human Rights Council. And now it's time, especially on this International Day of Education, 
to add returning to UNESCO to th this list. So let me just give folks just the, the briefest background. The UN and UNESCO, of course, is an acronym. So David's right. We need to stop talking in alphabet soup. The UN Educational Scientific and Cultural Organization was founded in 1945, right after uh, the horrendous World War II uh, aftermath. It was the American poet, Archibald MacLeish, who wrote the first line of the UNESCO Constitution. And it's a line that defines its mission. It guides how its programs will be developed. He said, since wars begin in the minds of men, it's in the minds of men that the defenses of peace must be constructed. And so for 75 years, UNESCO has labored in this construction of peace using the tools of education, science and culture to build those bridges that join us in our common humanity and our connected futures. And our hands uh, in the United States have been absent too long from this labor. I had the opportunity, in fact, David uh, uh, went with me. Um, I was representing Education International and the National Education Association, AFT, our, our affiliates in Canada and the uh, Caribbean. I, I'm, I'm a vice president of our North American um, Caribbean region, which also includes Mexico. And I was there at UNESCO in Paris, uh, I think it was 2011, which seems like a lifetime ago. And I was there representing um, the World uh, Federation of Teachers Organizations. As, as David said, 32 million educators, 174 countries. And we were there to participate in World Teacher Day, which was a commemoration and participation in a policy roundtable on the state of the teaching profession. And we were preparing the framework of action around the soon to be adopted sustainable development goals and UNESCO was the lead agency on education. But while all that work was going on, I was just amazed at what else was going on in that building. Across the hall, throughout the building, were parallel discussions regarding world heritage sites, anti-Semitism, discrimination in all its forms, press freedom, scientific advancement. And I loved that UNESCO understood the importance of all of these connections. I am a certified elementary teacher. My life's work has been um, as an educator to realize the education of what we call the whole child, creative, critical mind, healthy body, ethical, compassionate character. And I felt that harmony of connections and purpose in UNESCO. There was no one size fits all, just memorize this. It was holistic. It was an epicenter of global collaboration around not just the most important ideas that shape the future of the planet, but the most fundamental values that have to serve as the building blocks. Education, science, culture in service to what? To a more peaceful, just, sustainable world. And I don't look at UNESCO's work as an act of charity that the United States needs to get back into UNESCO because uh, we're somehow the donor nation. UNESCO's work is an act of justice. And it's not just about fixing developing countries. UNESCO impacts me as an American teacher working in one of the richest countries on the planet. I need UNESCO. I need a place that brings the world's finest minds together for collaborative discussions, publications, training on multi but I can't even say that, multi-dimensional approaches to child development, reflective pedagogy on the nature of learning itself to know, to be, to do, to live together. What's more relevant today and more foundational to American challenges than the rise we've just seen 
in anti-democratic forces, authoritarianism, white nationalism, a lot of diverse organizations and individuals who are using the common tools of disinformation, distrust of the other, divisions based on race, ethnicity, culture, by denying science whether it's COVID or climate change, their purpose is the opposite of peaceful justice. And it lives here in our home, here in the United States. We need UNESCO in this essential long-term work of peace. But today, right here, right now, there is urgent immediate work to do. It can't wait for the long term. The immediate crisis of rebuilding education systems ravaged by this pandemic. It's going to require all hands on deck right here, right now. And America has been watching from the back of the room. UNESCO's Institute for Educational Statistics is the premier global body aggregating educational data. Its global education monitoring report team is at the forefront of analysis and insight. Its International Institute for Education Planning systemically brings together the best research, the best training on education planning. In fact, UNESCO's Global Education Coalition is the world's main body where all education actors from the public and the private sector can come together to coordinate the response in addressing the needs of those over 1 billion students that, that David was talking about, who lost access to schooling and educational services. And you know that those students live in the world's poorest nations and in the world's richest nations. The United States has the world's richest school systems and the world's poorest, depending on which zip code you live in. We need this help. The United States can't afford to be a simple observer. We have to have a seat at the table, contributing, learning, designing, improving. And it has to be practical and evidence-based. And it has to maintain the highest standards of equity of access and opportunity. I was really taken by your comments because they were so reflected in all the world uh, examples brought together this morning at UNESCO's kickoff ceremony because they tapped into people's experience, but it was a reminder how important UNESCO is and you've just summed it up beautifully for us. I think about this um, from a lot of different angles. Global Minnesota works a lot in the schools, but we were born uh, by a group of, of women community leaders 70 years ago, 1951, who could see that international students were coming to Minnesota and to the whole country, and some were having a rough time. Some were being met with racial attack and other really serious things. And they said, we cannot tolerate this. They created first a kind of informal group to greet and then welcome and then support international students and faculty, some, but mostly students. And, and we've grown uh, since that time. But this morning and the UNESCO program, there was a leader from the international organization that does a lot of uh, the international exchange of students. Uh, he was saying that they're 100 years old and they've lived through nine pandemics. But this was the only one that touched everybody on the planet. And I was taken by his uh, overview, that historic understanding, but also about how he has distinguished this particular pandemic from the others that have been devastating in different places and different times in different ways. And I believe that that's part of the wisdom in a way of those who created a UNESCO, a World Health Organization, a food and agriculture organization, et cetera, is that they knew that over time we needed to gather and sustain attention, expertise. You were describing the international statistical bodies and others. And we also need to make sure that by knowing our history, we know what is similar and what is different. We know where we've made progress and where we're falling backwards. And it feels like this moment now 
uh, and you both have referenced uh, kind of new energy coming from Washington. I was uh, struck by that in this uh, YouTube um, uh, channel where Dr. Jill Biden, just a couple days after the swearing in, uh, did a seminar and some speaking for that the teachers put together in the United States. And I think anyone watching this now could find that, but she was so clear about both the passion, but also the commitment, the long-term. But she also was, you know, she explained she was having to teach her classes as she was getting on the plane to go to the inauguration. I mean, this is a teacher now at the highest levels who gets it, but also has the ability to articulate it in ways that learners, educators and others. So I feel like um, my, broken heart of the grief and the dislocation and you know we could describe this in all kinds of ways is one part of me but another part of me is the opening up that is happening in the conversation and the real possibilities of re-engagement but also as you were describing how you as a teacher as a leader need unesco but also we need each other this idea of the pandemic you know, we're Minnesotans, so we're always quoting, you know, Paul Wellstone, our senator who was killed tragically, and his most famous quote, just flat out, we all do better when we all do better. Now people are creating new ways, like we can't all do better until we all do better when it comes to this pandemic. And this is going to be part of our heritage and who we are going forward is, the question isn't, you know, how did you handle? The question is, how did you build back better? And it feels like the leadership from the uh, teachers organizations and from teachers themselves, the leadership from your international organization and from these wonderful groups that are coming together in these campaigns is going to be crucial. Is there, um, a way for us to be able to make available to the couple thousand or so people that have pre-registered or signed up in some way um, the statement that will be coming uh, because you were clear and <laughs> people are looking for uh, ways and we'll even be talking about this again later today but um, can I uh, count on you to get me a copy of this and I can make sure that that it gets out. Yes, Mark, um, I'll, I'll send you the, the letter that I've sent to uh, President Biden uh, and his team. The, and, and other people, I, I encourage you to write to the Biden administration. And uh, just put it, White House, Washington, DC. Uh, they, they, know where it it <laughs> they know where it is. Uh, but one of the reasons I was so excited to receive your invitation to be on this uh, is because UNESCO means so much to me. And because we are now not talking to a brick wall. We are talking, as you said, to someone who understands by being married to a teacher uh, exactly what it is. I always thought we should have our spouses be on our bargaining teams because it's <laughs> our spouses that know how much work we put into uh, into uh, the joyful labor of being an educator. And I don't want us to get back into UNESCO um, with arrogance, with yes, we need to come in and save the world. We need a respectful partnership. And UNESCO is all about building those bridges um, that have been burned, that have been ripped to shreds. I want people to know I, as an educator, as a sixth grade teacher from Utah, need UNESCO. And here you are, Education Minnesota, I mean, Global Minnesota. I come from Utah. People think of us as kind of like, well, yeah, you're like the middle class, whitest people in the whole wide world. There is such rich, beautiful diversity in our communities that most people who just know the brand of Minnesota or the brand of Utah, uh, they, they don't, they've never been on the ground to see that we are also relocation spots for refugees. Amen. 
They pick yes. our communities. And so our teachers need help in how do you not just navigate diversity, how do you make it bloom? How do you make it come to life and be something that you that you're that all your students learn from? And so uh, I, I rely on global education. I want to be a partner. I want our organizations, our unions, our community groups to be partners. And now's our chance. Uh, and we, we can make this case to the Biden administration. And they are listening to us.